Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Americans for Peace Now webinar. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ori Neer. We'll be addressing a topic today that not many Americans are familiar with, but uh, has been a major issue in Israeli-American bilateral relations uh, and has severely impacted, of course, American citizens of Palestinian and other Arab descent. Uh, this issue in a nutshell is the restrictions on travel into and through Israel for Palestinian Americans and for other Arab Americans, and the harsh treatment of uh, Palestinian and other Arab Americans who enter Israel. Uh, if you have Palestinian American friends, I'm sure that you've heard some stories. Uh, we'll probably hear more today. Um, we'll explore this topic and discuss what can be done about it uh, with our two guests, both Palestinian American. We, I'll introduce them in a moment. Before I do that, uh, uh, regular housekeeping uh, uh, comments. Uh, first, as you know, uh, this uh, uh, is being recorded. The video will be posted on YouTube. The audio will become a, uh, an episode on our podcast, PeaceCast, uh, sometime la later today, uh, God willing, inshallah. Um, you're yeah, welcome to- It will definitely be captioned for the deaf. Yes, and we'll have a, yeah, we'll have a, uh, a transcript, yeah. And um, obviously you are as always welcome to ask questions. We encourage it. Uh, please use the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen to do that, not the raise hand tool. It's better to use the, the Q&A one. Uh, just write your questions and keep them short because we uh, go through them as we go along um, uh, with, with the webinar. So uh, our guests today are busy people. Uh, we worked <laughs> hard to find uh, a time slot that worked for both of them, but we managed. We thank them both again for making it and being with us. I promise to them to be, that we won't go beyond 45 minutes. So this is gonna be a little shorter than the usual. Uh, for the interest of time, therefore, I'm not going to go through their bios, just do a quick introduction. Um, Hanna Hanania is a uh, dentist here in Northern Virginia. Uh, he finds time for public action in various Arab American and Palestinian American organizations. He has been uh, lobbying uh, the US government for years on this topic that we're discussing today. And um, when I did the research for this webinar and talked to some of my uh, Palestinian American friends, they all said, Kol Hanna, he's the man, he knows. So I did. Uh, and then we have uh, Maisun Zayed, she's a celebrity. Most of you probably know her. Uh, she's a performing artist, a comedian, an actress, an author, an activist. Um, she, I've, I've attended, you know, several gatherings of mm -hmm. Palestinian Americans in which she performed uh, with her Arab English or English Arabic or whatever you want to call it, and her <laughs> Arabish, uh, Arabish. <laughs> Arab, that's it. Uh, Self-deprecating mm -hmm. humor, uh, such as the routine, which I will never forget about her father sending her to Palestine to find a groom. Uh, I was at an event where she talked about it and people were just rolling on the floor <laughs> and loving, loving her. So thank you both, Maisun and Hanna, for joining us. Ahlan Fiko. Ahlan Fiko. Thank you, Ori. Um, Hanna, let's, let's start with you and um, uh, give us a quick introduction to what the issue actually is, what is the gist of the problem, and why has it become more of an issue now? Uh, how is it related to Israel's request for inclusion in the United States visa waiver program? Uh, first, let me thank you for doing this. I'm glad you're highlighting on such an important issue. Thank you for Peace Now for allowing us to talk about this very important issue. My soon, always an honor to be with you on the panel, even though you do make me look bad because you're so amazing, but uh, it's always nice to be with you. Um, Palestinian American community is around half a million people. It's basically made up of immigrants who started coming to the US more than a hundred years ago. Today, the community is the vast majority and probably more than two thirds of it are American born, lived all their life in the United States. And many of them has not been to Palestine many times. Many of them have never been to Palestine. Uh, however, on the other end, there are a good a few thousand Palestinian Americans who are living in Palestine today. And these are people who came to the US, worked here or studied here, and then they decided to retire in few cases to also invest and work in Palestine. 
So we're talking about a few different segments and unfortunately these different segments are being treated differently by the Israeli government in many different ways. So when you're traveling to Palestine, if you happen to be a Palestinian American who has a Hawaii or a Palestinian passport, which in many cases could be like my kids. My kids were born in Virginia Fairfax Hospital and they were raised in the United States. But it's very hard for us to travel when we have a Palestinian passport and they don't. So eventually we were kind of forced into getting them a Palestinian passport. In this particular case, you cannot go to the airport. You have to go to a nearby country. In this particular case, it's Jordan. And then you have to cross into the West Bank if you're trying to go to the West Bank. Oh, if you're just, trying to, to... just to clarify, Hannah, sorry for interrupting. A Palestinian passport is issued by the Palestinian Authority, right? Not by Israel. Uh, it's, it's issued by the Palestinian Authority, but it's basically a replacement to the ID card that was called Hawiya that basically was issued by the Israelis. So directly it's issued by the Palestinian Authority and directly it's uh, approved by the Israelis. So, so Israel has all the logs of, of, of the names and of the, okay. Exactly, exactly. So basically it has to be approved by them and it has to be what they call, they call it entered in the computer before you can travel. So it's basically one day until the Israelis process it because before it become effective. Um, so you have to go to Jordan. Um, already it's a long flight or Jordan does not have many of the direct flights from from the United States. And then you have to cross the borders, basically going to the West Bank and the Jerusalem. And we'll talk about the Gaza in a little bit because that becomes much more complicated, much harder way to travel to Gaza. Uh, then you have to go to Jordan. We we'll probably end up having to spend the night in Jordan uh, because of the time of the when the bridge open and so on. And then we have to cross through the bridge the next day. The bridge we're talking about, it's in basically a uh, Jericho area, like the Dead Sea area. It's a very, very hot, extremely hot, especially in the summer when we're usually going. Uh, with the kids, it's like such a miserable trip. I mean, the trip from here to, to the Middle East is nothing compared to crossing the bridge. We're talking about the 60 miles travel between Amman and Jerusalem. And this 60 miles sometimes could take us a good six, seven, eight hours. I remember one time we were traveling and it was before one of the holidays, like the day before, and we were trying to travel and there were 32 buses ahead of us that trying to basically cross the bridge. Eventually we managed to buy something called VIP, which is a very expensive service that you can go through. But the next day I heard so many people, more than half of the 32 buses end up spending the night in the way of trying to cross the bridge. And when we say spend the night, you're talking about spending a night in, in the desert, no bathrooms, no food, no nothing, nothing. Basically, you're just stuck in the desert with nothing. And the stories we were hearing about people like so many insects coming and hurting them, especially when they were trying to find a place so they can kind of use, for, it's not really a bathroom, but just trying to do their stuff outside. And it's just so, so horrible to cross the bridge usually. Sometimes it's less than others, but even on the best day, you're still going to spend the four hours to just cross these 60 miles. And then after that, you go to the West Bank, you're not allowed to go to Jerusalem or any other places. You just or the basically. Beach. You <laughs> exactly. You're not allowed to go anywhere. Um, except unless you were able to get a permit, which is really not easy to get a permit. And uh, in that particular place, if it already took my kids to like, let's say Ramallah, I mean, you really want to take them to Jerusalem. I'm not even talking about Jerusalem as a religious or spiritual fact, but Jerusalem as a city, as I mean, it has so many things that if you're already 12 miles away from Jerusalem, and I'm kind of going to Jerusalem does become extremely important to do, but you're not allowed to do it. And in the cases where we are allowed to do it, we end up having to go a major checkpoint at Kalandia. And sometimes that actually end up being another two, three hours trip just to cross a 12, a 12 miles a trip between Ramallah and Jerusalem, because we have to go through long lines, long checkpoints and so on. And in this particular case, uh, Palestinian Americans are being treated uh, just like the same way they'd be treating the Palestinians, if not worse in many cases. Um, I recall an incident when I was 15 years old. Um, I was just sitting with a couple of my friends in front of our house at that time. And I was not an American citizen at that time. One of my friends was American citizen. His particular case, he's American citizen, but he could not 
to get the residency in Palestine. That's another issue that many Palestinian Americans suffer from. Um, is, and it used to be worse before, now it's a little different, but it used to be if you stay out of Palestine more than 12 months, you basically end up using your Hawaii, and in many cases, it means you cannot go back. This is a big issue with people with Jerusalem ID today. If they stay outside for some time, they lose the Hawaii, and if they try to get it back, it becomes a very long process, extremely expensive, that most people end up not having to go through it because it's almost impossible to be able to get it. And this only applies to basically Palestinians. Um, if you happen to be a non-Palestinian in Jerusalem, you don't have to go through that process just to Palestinians. American, even if you have American passport or if you don't, you, you would lose your Hawaii if you stay outside Jerusalem for a while. So in the interest of time, I want to kind of jump in and, and piggyback because time is important. I think a couple of things um, that were said really need to be clarified, which is if you are an American citizen who you are a Palest who is of Palestinian descent, whether you are like Hanna and you have a Palestinian ID and a Palestinian Hawaii, or you are like me, an American citizen born and raised in America that holds no other allegiance you are 100% discriminated against. The U.S. consulate knows this, the U.S. government knows this, the Biden administration knows this. So unlike Hanna, I don't have a Hawaii. And I was married for 10 years. I could have gotten a Hawaii. I chose not to because I would not be able to go to Jerusalem and I wouldn't be able to fly into Tel Aviv. And like, you know, the, the 48 lands are, are a big part of, my life and my touring, I hang out in Nazareth and all, all these other things. I wanted access to the entire country. As an American citizen, I can use all three border crossings, but Israel has the right to deny me entry at all times. So my father, who's my hero and my champion, is buried in our village in Deir Dewan in Palestine. Every single time I fly a plane into Tel Aviv, I don't know if they're gonna let me in or not. And it's completely arbitrary. Israel, Israel's border control denies American citizens access whenever they want. So they're asking to be able to fly into America completely unchecked when they are shamelessly treating Americans who are Palestinian completely differently, especially when it comes to what Hannah said about going to Jerusalem. He's not allowed, just let me finish this really sure, important sure. sentence. Go ahead. He's not allowed to go to Jerusalem. However, an American citizen that lives in a settlement like Gilo or Beth Il can go to the airport. They live in the West Bank too, but because they're Israeli, they're allowed to go to Jerusalem, they're allowed to go to the airport. They don't have to have Israeli citizenship. They could just be American citizens who are hanging out at the settlement and they have rights that we do not have. So Americans are being denied equality by Israeli border control at the exact same time that they're begging us to let Israelis into this country unchecked and not afford those same rights to Palestinians who are coming from the exact um, same area. So it doesn't matter if you're born and raised in the States or if you have Palestinian ID, the discrimination is across the board. It's all encompassing and it's extremely dehumanizing. And I want to let you jump in, but when we're done, I want to tell you a couple of stories of what has happened to me. Exactly, <laughs> so that's, that's what I want. So, but before I ask you to do it, and I'd like you to do it, um, uh, just, to, just to piggyback on what you just said, uh, the, the gist of the issue now is that Israel is asking uh, to be included in the US visa waiver program, and there is a reciprocity uh, demand uh, requirement in that agreement, which um, uh, re requires that, that Israel treat uh, American citizens in, in, when they enter Israel in the same way that the United States treats Israeli citizens as they enter the United States. Um, Hannah described to us what happens to him and his family when they try to cross into Israel uh, or into the West Bank through uh, the Allenby Bridge. What happens at the airport, Maisun? 
So first of all, I've had to cross Allenby. I've done all the borders except for Rafah, and it's literally hell on earth. It's the lowest point on earth, and it's the lowest place on earth to be. It is extremely dehumanizing. Every single layer of government dehumanizes you. For me, when I fly into the airport, it's funny because I'm a touring comedian, so I fly a lot. And usually whenever you fly, it's so exciting to land. You're like, I've landed. When a Palestinian American lands in Israel, it's anxiety. Am I gonna get the good cop security guard or the bad cop security guard? Now, Israeli border control knows exactly who I am. I've been performing stand-up comedy in Palestine since 2002. I did a movie with Adam Sandler. They are 100% aware that my cerebral palsy, shaky booty, is not a terrorist threat. Yet, I am not allowed to board an airplane leaving from Tel Aviv to Newark carrying anything but my passport and a credit card. I'm not allowed to have a backpack, a computer, a cell phone, a book. I'm not allowed to carry medication. And it's completely arbitrary. They escort me to be strip searched. After I'm strip searched, I am escorted to the airplane. The security stays with me the entire time. I sit down in first class with nothing. And then the crew kind of swoops in and are like, we want to give you everything. We're so, so, we're so sorry. We hate to see this. And then the crew files a complaint when we land in Newark because of how an American citizen was treated. This is how I'm treated when they know who I am, when they know that I'm on Twitter, when they know I talk about them all the time. That's how they treat me. So a big part of it is dehumanize and intimidate so they never want to come back. Then the visa itself is arbitrary. Sometimes they'll let me stay three months. Sometimes it's one week. Sometimes I land at 9.30 and I leave the airport at 4.30 in the morning. Sometimes I land at 9.30, 10.30 a.m. I'm out the door. Completely arbitrary. You never know what's going to happen. There's always a deep, deep fear of being sent back because Israel rejects entry to Americans who are critical of Israeli policies. So like people are always like, why aren't you vocal about BDS? And I'm like, because I want to be able to visit my father's grave, because I want to be able to shoot my web series in Ramallah and show the world that Palestine is something other than demolished buildings. And I have complained nonstop to the consulate, nonstop to my congressmen, my senators, and now, you know, Sen Secretary Blinken even. And people are like, we know, we know, and nothing can be done. And I feel like even if they demand something can be done, who's going to enforce it? When you call the consulate, they say, we know, and there's nothing we can do. My so, soon, I just, yeah. I just want to add, you know, it's not sure. always people who are very critical either. There were many, many oh, cases arbitrary. where American born, never been there. And we had a very well documented case in 2014, where we sent a delegation from our group American born, never active, don't know anything about the issue. Um, they held them for seven hours. The American, the State Department was very aware of the trip and they were with us on the phone when we were doing it. And they held them for seven hours and then they banned them from going back for 10 years. There was no years. reason whatsoever. The State Department was aware of the trip. It was arranged with the State Department. They were with us on the phone when we were at the border and they, and these were American born, never involved in the issue. And they just didn't, all of them were basically college students. So Hannah, maybe tell us a little bit about your uh, advocacy on this issue in the past. I know that the two of you participated in the meeting with uh, with uh, Secretary Blinken about a year ago or so. But I know that Hannah, that your uh, advocacy on this goes back many years. Uh, what kind of, of advocacy have you been involved with with the with the with the government, both administration and Congress? For the most part, it's telling the story. Um, we have been telling them the story for years. They used to complain at the beginning that we don't have enough documented cases. Um, that's a trip in 2014. We kind of met with them many, many times in the State Department about it before it happened. So the whole thing was very well documented with them and they witnessed that whole trip. Uh, like really, it, they were kind of very, very involved with it. So they saw that and we had so many other documented cases that we've been really showing it to them. In many cases also, many people are being held, especially at the airport, they end up going to jail or for a couple of days before they even deport them back. Many of them, American citizens, never been there, no really good reason being given. 
Never been in jail, like son- completely terrified. Yeah, I, there is a professor from Iowa. He ended up spending six days in jail and uh, he had no idea. He basically just went on a trip he was not expecting this to happen. And like my son said, it became an issue in many people. They would think two, three, four times, what's gonna happen to me when I basically land? It's such an anxiety yeah. issue now to land at the airport. Um, so we basically been telling them about the stories. We've been meeting with them very regularly at the State Department about this issue, very regularly for the last 10 years, complaining about it, showing them what will happen, telling them the story. Really, we haven't seen much of an action. Um, the trip in 2014, we basically were told they're gonna yeah, like kind of help us and so on in the State Department, but really it was one of the worst ones and one of the most coordinated ones with the State Department at that point. Hannah is, is the good cop, I'm the bad cop. My approach is whenever I'm in contact with the Biden administration, I'm like, who's boss? Aren't you the one who's given them all that money and all that aid? Why can't you simply tell them it's done? We know it happens, it stops now, you treat them equally. Because the reason that I have flight attendants documented, the reason that I call the consulate, is I think I'm one of the best cases. It's 100% clear that I'm not a security threat. This is torture, it's human rights violations. They have literally been stripping me since I'm five years old. I remember being five years old and having to take off my pantyhose and having cerebral palsy and not being able to put them back on. This doesn't just happen to adults. They treat children exactly the same way. These are human rights violations. I know that they think I don't have a right to visit my family and my village and my dad's grave and the Dome of the Rock and celebrate Christmas where Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Hannah knows I like to party in, in, in Bethlehem on Christmas. They, I feel like the administration is so weak because they have the power to simply say it's done. It's not happening anymore. And instead they're like, I know he hits you, but he's so nice to me. You're referring to a, uh, 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 domestic relations. domestic uh, uh, violence uh, cases, yeah. I'm laughing about abuse because they've broken us. No, we will never be broken. <laughs> but it is, that- it's such a genuine fear. Like, I think about it all the time. Like, if this is the time they decide to throw me in a cell, like, you know, is Ori going to break me out? Is Ned Price going to come get me? Or am I going to die in an Israeli jail because I wanted to go have some pomegranate? Now, so here's a question. I mean, Israel has legitimate security concerns and uh, one can say it's, you know, it's a sovereign country and it can decide that its method of uh, screening the people who come in. I won't even, I won't even let you finish. You can't say that you're a sovereign nation if we have no idea where the frick your borders are. So the reality is there's no way to get into any Palestinian village anywhere without, can, without crossing an Israeli border. So the idea that they get to decide who visits us and who doesn't visit us and who can go home and who can't. When we use words like sovereign country, I just want to know like, where are those borders and why don't we control any of them? You know, so like, I don't, there has to be some aspect of that conversation that says you are illegally occupying these people's land and controlling their movement, both in and out, instead of a sovereign nation with valid concerns. And for the most part, most of these cases, I mean, we're not talking about the security concerns yeah. really. For the most part, it's just, I mean, if, when you when you look at what's happening, actually Palestinian Americans who never been there, who are not involved in the issue and so on, seems to be harassed the most. And my personal opinion is this is happening in a way telling them don't come back again here. Because when, like, I mean, like I'm very active in issues and so on. I don't get as harassed as someone who was just born in the U.S. Now I'm going to get harassed next time. But anyway, more like someone who was born in the U.S. and just went there for a visit. These are the ones who do tend to get harassed most. And in many cases, it's happening with anybody with Arab Islamic name. Um, there was basically one person who went on a trip with the with the congressman. It's, she worked for a congressman and she went on a basically, not with a congressman, but on congressman visit and because her name was kind of a Muslim name she was treated the same way we were just talking about 
Yeah. If Israel I've heard is really of, of worried Jews. about that. Yeah, just, just to let you know, uh, I've heard of Jews, uh, American Jews with uh, Muslim sounding names, you know, Sephardi Jews who were given the treatment as well. So it's, it's profiling. Um, but but what, I, what I wanted to ask my soon when uh, earlier was um, one can say a country is ha you know is is allowed to decide that its method of screening people is profiling. Great. What's Fun. wrong with great. that? So great. That's great. How about we get your ass off the border in Jericho and have that entry be directly into Palestinian land? And then you don't have to decide who's coming in and out because that's actually not recognized as your land in any way, shape or form or your border. So how about Israel? Um, allow because Palestinians can't scratch their own booties without Israel stamping a paper and saying they're allowed to. How about they allow us to have an airport in the West Bank so that Palestinians can fly directly into the West Bank and we don't have to cross their border because it's not about security. It's about, like you said, you have the right to profile. You have the right to say out loud, we are a supremacist country we judge people based on faith, and we will treat Americans in the same despicable way that we treat people living on this land. They do have the right to do that. But if they do that, then the United States of America should not reward them with a visa waiver. The United States of America should not reward them with a you know blank check to write whenever they want. If your citizens are being abused by a government that chooses to have supremacist bigoted hateful tactics as part of their border control. America should not be supporting that, allowing that, or turning their backs to what's happening to their own citizens. Hannah, uh, now that the negotiations between Israel and the United States uh, are intensifying for uh, Israel's inclusion in the uh, visa waiver program. Are you also, you plural, uh, intensifying your efforts to lobby, to, to advocate with the United States government on this issue? We are. We definitely wanted to make sure they understand the situation as much as they can. And they're familiar with all the cases that's happening and all the documentation that's happening. I'm a little concerned with all the media that's uh, leakage that's happening and all the media uh, reports that's coming out and very concerned that we might be looking into a newer classification of what's a Palestinian American uh, a lot of these reports are talking about Palestinian Americans living in Palestine or American Palestinians living in the US. Um, it's really going to be discrimination regardless if they start to dividing it into different classification and kind of getting the issue into the details and going back to process of applying to a permit, you end up really where you are. If, if it's a matter of a discrimination, it's a black and white. It's you either discriminate against everyone or you don't discriminate everyone. And I'm worried that discussion and that's, that's heading towards is trying to do, do many different classifications, going back towards applying for permit to be able to use the airport or get a visa and so on. So leaving it as is, but kind of in a way trying to pretend that something has changed, but in the reality, nothing changes. And that's where we're trying to put most of our efforts, trying to explain the reality of what's happening and that you cannot start taking it piece by piece. It's either you discriminate or you don't discriminate, period. I'm Palestinian, so I know we've already lost it and they're going to win and nothing's going to change. But to acknowledge one of the questions in the uh, Q&A mm -hmm. about why are we advocating for Palestinian Americans and not Palestinians in general, that's just this specific conversation because as Hannah said, the easiest way to show that this is straight up, you know, discrimination and bigotry is to say one American is treated this way, the other American is treated that way. It doesn't mean that we're not having extensive conversations about the ongoing war crimes and human rights violations that happen in Palestine every single day. It's just that this conversation, our strongest, most valid talking point is two citizens walk into Tel Aviv, one is Arab Palestinian Muslim, the other is an American Jewish person, and we are treated completely differently, simply based on our faith. So uh, my soon thanks. Uh, this actually gives me a segue to a, a kind of a broader question that I wanted to ask uh, to, to sort of uh, uh, broaden the scope, and that has to do with whether you feel, and if so, how, 
uh, that the discourse in the United States has changed on Palestinian rights and on the conflict. No. You're, you're shaking your head, but- No, 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 no. So no, not at all. Same people who were always fighting apartheid and fighting for equality and fighting for human rights have always been on the side of Palestinians. The conversation is louder now because we've made incredible, incredible connections with the black community in the United States, the indigenous communities worldwide who have suffered similar genocides and displacements. I'm always uncomfortable about the fact that I live on stolen land in New Jersey of the Lenny Lenape Ramapo natives. And I think that the conversation in Washington from Joe Biden to Nancy Pelosi to you know, everyone except for Rashida Tlaib and Cory Bush is we love Israel. We will always love Israel. We will always vote with Israel. I just saw a great movie that everyone should see called Boycott by Julia Bacha. And it was about how like 33 states have passed uh, be laws that make it illegal to like BDS, to boycott Israel. And when they asked the Congress people, why did you vote yes on this? This is actually a violation of the First Amendment and the right to protest. They said, I had no idea what was in the bill. It said Israel, and I always vote yes on Israel. Joe Biden, who, <laughs> you know, I worked tirelessly on the Biden campaign as a disability advocate. Joe Biden watched Palestinians have their butts literally kicked while praying sunrise prayers in the Dome of the Rock in Ramadan. He didn't say a word to condemn it, not a single word. But then the second that Palestinians chose violence to retaliate, he had a lot to say about the Palestinian reaction, but not the fact that people who were praying, women and children praying on the highest holy day, the equivalent of Christmas Eve at St. Patrick's Cathedral, were beaten and tear gassed and not in self-defense and nothing was said for those people. Nothing was even said when a journalism headquarter, a building that housed the press was bombed to the ground, even that was not condemned. Israel is the 51st state and it is America's most beloved. They love Israel more than they love New Jersey. Nothing has changed, nothing will change. We're about to lose this battle, but I just wanted to, you all to know how bad it is. So maybe they'll be shamed into letting me in the next time I finally get to go. I'm a Boy, comedian, well, by the way. I hope you're all laughing. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I want to say now is, you know, with, uh, with my, my APN hat on, is that um, we will do what we can so that you don't lose this battle. Uh, we think that it's important and we are, uh, we're going to, you know, put whatever our weight is worth, uh, uh, put our weight on it. But, you know, talking about uh, um, uh, organizations and their, um, ability to to generate change i wanted to ask you hannah about and i'm this is not in a vexing manner i'm just interested why it is that um palestinian americans are not better organized why don't they have organizations that uh resemble even you know come close to uh the kind of uh pro-israel lobbying organizations we see here in washington that's an amazing question and i wish i have the answer to that question I have the answer. Oh. if he doesn't have the answer I have the Go answer. Ahead, There's so much fear in participating in any pro-Palestinian work because NGOs and non-for-profits are villainized and classified as terrorist organizations. So there's a lot of fear of publicly organizing in the community. There's something that we share with other minority and um, immigrant communities that is we work all the time and we don't have the ability to like exclusively be, you know, trolling the internet and doing Hasbro. That takes a lot um, of money and, and funding. And when you try to move any money around as a Palestinian, it's flagged, whether you're in New Jersey or you're in um, the Arab world. And I do not think it's a reflection of the abject failure of the non-existent Palestinian leadership. I think Palestinians have tried to organize, but the ramifications of organizing 
which include being denied entry to Palestine, really terrify a large swath of this community. You agree, Hannah? I, I agree, but I also want to kind of be a little more hopeful. And I think we're seeing many <laughs> changes in what Maysoon just said. I think many of the younger generation are not terrified or not worried about this stuff and they're willing to take the fight. I think we're seeing that a lot with many of the Americans. I think the community is getting older. As the community is getting older, more established in the US, this is becoming also, they have more time and money to spend in this. And we're definitely seeing that happening as well. Uh, now, the issue of all, all the new legislations with the BDS that's really kind of harassing everybody in their own work, uh, like living environment, especially that many of it is happening on a local level. Um, and the new definition of anti-Semitism that's considering criticizing Israel to be anti-Semitism are definitely big challenges that the community is facing at this point and looks like we're gonna be facing even more moving forward. I'm talking in Virginia where a new governor was just took office two days ago, and the first thing he did is trying to pass a new anti-Semitism law that's putting criticizing Israel as part of being anti-Semitic, and also new legislation against BDS was just introduced. These two things just happened two days ago, so that's why I'm kind of pushing into these issues more than others. But these definitely major obstacles and challenges the community is facing. But I have to say things do seem improving in many areas as well. And, and I agree, you the younger it, you... generation is a lot less fearful. The younger generation is better at social media and better um, at organizing. And by the way, the younger generation is much more mixed. So you have kids that are half Palestinian, half Cuban, you know, mm -hmm. and they, they, that community does have a lot more zeal and a lot less fear. So I do think there's hope in the youth. And, and Maysoon, you mentioned the uh, intersectional um, energy as something that is also positive in that context, context, right? Yeah, I mean, people who are truly doing human rights work and anti-violence work and anti-colonialism, imperialism, supremacy work are very clear on Palestine being a unity issue for them. So, you know, we've united with Black Lives Matter. There is a very, very strong and vibrant Palestinian queer LGBT community that is also uniting, you know, with the LGBT communities um, worldwide. And also like, you know, people think of Christians as evangelicals. Like, number one, don't forget, as I said, Jesus was born in Palestine. Palestinians are also Christian. And I've seen a lot of solidarity from churches in the United States of America that also support Palestinian rights and, and Palestinian equality. I've seen much more of us in the progressive spaces than I did during the 2016 campaign. 2020, a conversation was being happening. So even though I'm not seeing on the highest levels a change, the fact that the Iron Dome was even stopped for 15 seconds was because of younger generation, because of intersectional movements, because of equality movements, including us. And I want, I want to add also to what my son said, we're also noticing more and more of the Jewish community speaking out on this issue. Yeah. And I think, Definitely. I think that's actually even encouraging more and more Palestinian Americans to be involved and making the argument much stronger and allowing many more access that we didn't have before. I'm sorry, that was a very serious point and my cat just slunk by and I was laughing, but I'm not laughing at Jewish solidarity. It is really amazing. And I, I always love like when Sarah Silverman retweets something about Palestine. I'm like, yes, a big comic Jewish voice saying it. Uh, my son, that's I mean, me, and my son, yeah. me and my son know that having the Jewish community and many more of the Jewish community on on the, on the right side of this issue is what's going to make the difference. Well, you both know that, and we would love to see more and more of the Jewish community speaking out the truth about this issue. And 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 while we say that, we say it because it really isn't a religious issue. It's an equality issue. Like people always love to frame this like they've been fighting for two thousand years, and it's like no, it's really simple. It is best for every single soul living there if everybody has equal rights regardless of faith. And I know that it has been framed as a really fearful thing that if we give the Palestinians equal rights, they will immediately kill us. 
but that doesn't have any grounding in reality. And so I think when we have Jewish people worldwide, including refuseniks, people who refuse to serve in Israel that are on the side of justice, it reminds people that equality is not terrorism. Equality is not a bad thing. We all want this, it's best for all of us. We have time for one quick uh, question, which uh, I, I wanted to, um, just to, out of curiosity. I think you should ask about the cat. I think the cat is one of, one of, really one of the most beautiful cats I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> so, <laughs> yes, so cats, <laughs> Israel reserves the right to destroy your animal when you fly in. So not just reject the entry, they reserve the right to destroy it. So like I've never traveled with my animal, even though I pretty much can. And there are other people on the flight that have animals that are not like, they have the right to destroy my animal. It is literally spelled out. They won't just send you back. They'll take the cat, it's gone. <laughs> what was your final question? <laughs> My final question actually is, 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 I mean, it's both for both of you, but I think mostly for my student because you are a, um, uh, a, a performer and that has to do with Palestinians image in the media. I know that that's something that the Palestinian Americans have always been concerned with. And I wanted to gauge whether you see an improvement there. My sense very anecdotally is that there is some, but maybe I'm wrong about it. So we're killing it. We're killing it. Palestinians in the media it's, it's like our, our best publicity as Palestinians in the media, because I kind of feel like the two men sitting next to me should know this, but don't. Gigi and Bella Hadid are two of the most powerful women in the entire world. And them being really vocal about Palestine has removed the fear from other performers who are not just Arab or Palestinian, but in general, to speak out. I'm seeing performers who 10 years ago were like, it's complicated, fearlessly posting that like massacring children in Gaza is no longer acceptable. It has to stop. You can't just keep calling these people collateral damage. I have seen a lot of bravery, a lot more understanding, a lot of positive movement and Palestinian characters written into TV shows where it has nothing to do with terrorism, nothing to do with Israel, nothing to do. They just happen to be Palestinian. Um, and there's a lot of people who are Palestinian who are working behind the scenes and we're changing the narrative from, you know, behind the scenes and on the screen. I think we're doing great in media. Netflix just put 30 Palestinian films up as part of their channel. Like the ability to amplify the Palestinian message and the, the need and right for equality. To have 30 films accessible on Netflix, that's groundbreaking. So I, I managed to get you guys to end the conversation on a positive note, and that's a good thing. And I want to, <laughs> I want to wish you and, and the members of your See? community and all Americans that this issue be uh, addressed in the, in the most positive and constructive way. Uh, and I wanted to thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you for letting me escape so that I could go to my my next gig. And please, every single person watching, pray they let me in the next time I go. I talked a lot today. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you very much. Shukran jazeelan. Thank All you. Right. Bye now. Thank you, Ari. Thank you, guys. Yeah.